Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, in continuation to what we have discussed in the conceptions of nature, uh, there are different, differing uh, perception or ideas which involve in uh, the uh, relationship which is normally perceived to exist in the human and non-humans. And also, uh, we had discussed in the conception of nature the idea about uh, the my binary opposition which exists between the natural and supernatural by locating in different settings uh, that is the totemic system, the animic system and uh, naturalism. And uh, uh, going beyond that, uh, in, in this lecture we would be uh, primarily looking at the kind of uh, contestations or the contested domains and boundaries of culture. Now, in this, uh, it, I'll rely more on the works of uh, Tim Ingold, uh, wherein he had conducted an extensive study uh, among the for foraging culture, if not among the hunter and gathering societies. Now, normally, uh, it is widely perceived that uh, in the a social setting or in a, a cultural group. Uh, choices are being uh, made uh, depending on the kind of socialization one engage into. Uh, but then uh, there are also instances where individuals make their choices independently, not necessarily based on the kind of knowledge which is being imparted among the uh, members of the society. And also there is a differences between the older groups and the younger generations. And mostly, uh, I, I, I will also be giving or citing an example among the Cree uh, community, wherein they engage in uh, hunting and uh, mostly what are the kind of skills or if not a selection. Because over a period of time, uh, as the environment changes, so is also their kind of uh, technology which they usually engage into. Now, uh, for quite some time, uh, this human evolutionary ecology uh, happens to be one of the main or significant areas of research in ecological anthropology. And uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, particular lecture, I would try to uh, employ uh, the continuity and discontinuity and on the other hand the idea of this domination and protection. Who actually represent this domination and who actually protect? That is uh, who actually plays the sort of uh, the predator. Now, uh, if you look at the work of this Pelson, he tends to uh, uh, sort of uh, distinguishes three kinds of uh, the domain in the domain of human environmental relations and he posited three uh, sort of trends that is uh, the environmental orientalism, paternalism and also communalism. And each of these uh, in a way represent uh, a stance with respect to environmental issues. Now, uh, if you look at uh, in the case of both that is the environmental uh, orientalism and paternalism, uh, human in a way tends to uh, posit if not uh, uh, pre uh, sort of assume to be the masters of nature and therefore in the process engage 
directly or indirectly in exploiting, whereas uh, the latter, in a way, plays the role of the protex. Now, the protex, in a way, is uh, normally being uh, played by the kind of paternalistic attitudes or behaviors of human. Now, Orientalism, in a way, is uh, more uh, engaged in engaging in the exploiting. Now, uh, different from these two, the third one that is communalism, in a way, from uh, differs from both of these, because in communalism it involves uh, the rejection of any uh, sort of distinct demarcation, which sort of uh, engage, engage in looking at nature and society, and also between science and practical knowledge. Now, when we talk about practical knowledge, it is the knowledge which is normally uh, being practiced by the uh, native societies and which is known to be an informal uh, knowledge and which is again uh, antithetical to the science, the science which is practiced in academia. Now, this sort of demarcation between the formal and the non-formal knowledge is again uh, distinguishes uh, when we talk about the relationship between nature and society. And therefore, communalism in a way uh, sort of reject this idea of distinction uh, which normally is practiced by orientalism and paternalism. Now, uh, if you look at the for phrasing uh, uh, behavior, which is uh, pretty much uh, uh, inherent in the human hunter gatherers, uh, the kind of uh, environment which is specific to them, one engages in looking at the kind of uh, choices that is the selection, the rules, uh, which in a way is known as the cognitive algorithm that have been shaped through a uh, Darwinian process of uh, variation under natural selection. But as, as, we, as we agreed and uh, looked at how evolutionary or social evolution takes place, man becomes more uh, skillful and then their understandings becomes more rational and they are based on rational choices. But uh, to what extent the human society, if not an individual, engage in these choices or in terms of this natural selection is something we would be looking on. Now, uh, there is a term called uh, op op optimal foraging theory and in this uh, particular theory, it consists of uh, formal models which in a way uh, predict how under a given external conditions that is outside one's individual, a forager should behave uh, assuming that the overriding objective is to maximize the balance between the energy intake from harvested resources and the energy cost of procurement, which means uh, we can in a way contextualize in the uh, sort of uh, opposition between the domination and protection. And uh, in, in what circumstances, uh, how nature in a way provided uh, sort of the food and food supply to human and uh, to what extent the individual uh, that is the hunter in a way is able to maintain sort of a balance in this uh, whole uh, relationship. Therefore, this sort of uh, maximizing uh, the balances between the kind of uh, energy which is being consumed from the harvested resources and the energy which is being invested in this is something what optimal foraging theory uh, discusses, discusses and talk about. Now, the question is, is the human uh, hunter-gatherer in a way is engaged or practice or follow the principle of uh, economic or a specific of 
uh, optimal for it. Uh, now, it is interesting to bring uh, the dom uh, domain of this uh, economic in anthropology because uh, the first form of uh, economic engagement or one's external relationship with the physical environment is economic in character because uh, the kind of relations which normally is being used in uh, sort of the means of production is uh, what this optimal forager in a sense talks about. Now, what is this economic man then? The economic man surely in a way exercises his knowledge that is in terms of uh, the social interaction and also in doing this it tends to move on that is advances uh, it evolve into uh, a much more civilized or, or we can say uh, if we go by that evolutionary theory that uh, it moves from simple to a much more complex if not a civilized one uh, against this uh, background which is in, in, in intrinsically known as uh, resistant in nature. Now, therefore, uh, these rational choices, the rationality of this uh, optimal forager in a way is uh, I installed in the very heart of nature. That means, the human relationship with nature is pretty much interconnected. And again, uh, the kind of uh, domain of society and culture is more often times seen as uh, a source of external normative bias that may in a sense uh, result to some kind of uh, a deviation from the optimum. That is, uh, in, 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 in the real sense, it, it brings some kind of an imbalances rather than the bringing uh, balances because the amount of how we uh, interact if not exploit the resources to what extent uh, which of uh, the human or the non-human character brings out this idea of domination and protection. Now, uh, based on this rationality, if you try to bring in these rational choices in the natural selection of uh, in the context of the hunter and gatherers, uh, we can in a way see the differences that uh, the non-human counterparts is in a way compromised by social and cultural constraints. What are these social and cultural constraints then? Human in a way uh, is socialized and then the traditions and cultures are being learned and this, there are norms and values or ethos which guide an individual. And uh, mostly these norms and values are something which is uh, uh, sort of taught informally and which is mo more often time handed down from one particular generation to the other generations. And, uh, which in a way is uh, recorded or orally uh, uh, you know uh, put into practice now as as i talk about that uh, uh, the rationality in natural selection we'll try to look in what uh, is culture and the kind of choices what ones engage into now a hunter gatherers or a forager in a way inhabited or occupies an ecological niche which in a, a sense is characterized by uh, a diverse and heterogeneously uh, distributed resources. Now, being part of this uh, environment, uh, the hunter and gatherer then uh, tends to engage in choosing the sort of com uh, by uh, measuring if not looking at which more is which is more or in a sense less effectively and efficiently procure subsistence what what particular uh, idea if not choices tends to be more rational or in a way 
uh, rationality is also defined by the kind of uh, optimal uh, uh, output. So, if, if for instances, uh, if they feel that uh, the kind of uh, selection or choices tends to be more fruitful, then uh, obviously, uh, the forager would go for it. And uh, this more or less effective that is uh, being uh, combined and then once make their choices. This strategy in a way uh, winter holder in a way uh, make uh, a very vivid and strong observation wherein he says that the forage choice make up a strategy of adjustment to a particular ecological condition more or less based on adaptive uh, pattern and which result from the evolutionary processes and uh, the constraint of situation time and chances. Now, in a sense uh, the ecological condition what once engaged into or the kind of adaptive pattern one, what once follows, uh, if we see it from the point of evolutionism or evolutionary processes. There are these situation uh, I mean constraints which normally is being uh, witnessed that is time and space and situation in a sense become uh, sort of uh, the factors which influences ones in choosing the kind of strategy. Now, there, there is also this uh, a conflict of interest if not uh, contradiction which uh, normally cropped up uh, between the notions that uh, what once follows that is the strategy of adjustment which in a way is uh, again the result of a series of choices about where one wants to go for hunting and what wants to procure and also on the other hand uh, there is this adaptive pattern which is the product of again a revolutionary, evolutionary process. Now, this kind of choices with, which uh, is not just uh, about the ecological pattern what once involved or engaged into also, but the individual choices which becomes uh, more pertinent in this. Uh, discussion. Now, we will try to uh, look at some of the examples, the ethnographic study which is uh, done by Tim in gold, wherein the winter holder has uh, sort of summarized. Uh, in gold, in a way, stand quite uh, a number of years among the Cree hunter and uh, he closely examined the character, the kind of uh, the Cree members relationship with the non-human if not the environmental condition. Now, in this case uh, the Cree hunter is sort of unlikely to encounter this uh, same condition from one year to the next, because it is true that because uh, the environment changes and so is the uh, species which are around and uh, maybe the number of animals which are uh, I mean the abundant maybe previously might not be the case as the year goes on pass by. Therefore, in this particular situation uh, the forager in a way uh, tries to you know reinvent and bring out a different kind of tactics uh, and maybe in the past he might be uh, considered to be a good hunter and was also supposedly uh, uh, based on his ability to you know uh, handle almost any kind of animals. But things have changed over the years and then so is the environment and by contrast uh, uh, in opposition to the you know the elders if not the older generations. Uh, the younger hunters uh, in, in, in recent times are more said to be uh, specialized in hunting uh, just one or two species and 
in, in the process they are in a, uh, seen to be lacking competence in dealing with uh, the others. Now, what kind of differences we notice in this context? Uh, as you know, human evolved, we can uh, to some extent see the kind of skills and rational choices what one is embedded with. So, as they move on, uh, they are in a way loaded with different kinds of uh, skills and choices, but these skills and rationality in a way uh, narrowed down the kind of uh, choices what one generally have. But unlike that, uh, the elders or the older phrases are more holistic in their approach and the kind of knowledge is much more vast compared to younger generations. Now, therefore, one can actually look at how there is a shift in the, or the evolution or the tactics evolve, the kind of technology what one is engaged into are changing and evolving. This I am talking in the context of the evolutionary processes. Now, in this, uh, given the situation of the environment, hunters are usually faced with uh, choices. So, these choices in a way uh, happens to be uh, made up of a pattern and this pattern changes in response to the directions in the parameters of how hunting is brought about. For example, by the introductions of new technologies. So, they might not really rely on uh, the kind of knowledge which is being uh, uh, shared by the elders. They might come up with their own uh, choices and uh, these choices are nothing but by introducing new technologies. Now, the hunters in a way decisions to conform closely to what might be modeled as the optimal strategy for a uh, forager in trying to uh, uh, sort of fulfill or maximize uh, the net rate of energy gain. Therefore, uh, one might not really struggle to the extent of what used to be earlier. There, there, there will be definitely a way out or if not, one will try to find an easy way out rather. Now, usually it is uh, traditionally practiced that uh, the household of these tactical skill hunters uh, are being relatively secure and provisioned and also they are much more prosperous in terms of the uh, production of healthy offspring. Now, in this one can look at the social life and the economic man of uh, an individual. In the economic perspective, uh, one might be engaging in um, rational choices, but on the other hand, uh, in, in, in the social life that is in the context of the family, there would still be you know no reason to believe that the successful hunting strategy was the result of an evolutionary processes. Now, over here we, we tend to look at uh, no matter how successful an individual is socially or the kind of integration an individual have, but that does not guarantee that uh, that will replicate in the context of uh, hunting. Now, moving on we can in a sense uh, question by looking at how the behavior of a certain kind has evolved by natural selections and obviously, uh, with the natural uh, selections in the environment, uh, the behavior in a way also evolved. That is, what kind of behavior are we talking here? The behavior must not only have uh, the consequence for reproduction, but also are a consequence of the elements that are reproduced. This is uh, what uh, Ingol has argued. That is, uh, the elders who are constantly you know uh, engaging in much more of uh, a reproduction uh, naturally does not uh, lead to the uh, reproducing 
of what is actually required. Now, uh, so far as uh, these non-human animals are concerned, the kind of uh, elements which uh, usually are assumed to be uh, influenced by the genes. Now, there can be a different assumptions or uh, our attention in a way uh, to human beings looks in a way uh, unrealistic or maybe let us say irrational in, in a sense. Now, what is it to be realistic in that sense or uh, rather this sort of uh, instruction which are being uh, given to the younger lots tends to you know uh, have uh, if they have a strong genes or there is a genetic uh, connections which are usually uh, shared orally or through certain other kinds of uh, symbols or symbolic communications. Now, how far and to what extent this sort of cultural and uh, rather than genetic uh, has any kind of implication. Now, uh, Winterholder uh, happens to rightly observe and he closely noted that uh, in the case of this human forager, the informations or this knowledge are being passed on from uh, one particular generation to the other by culture and uh, which is in a sense these practices provide much of the strategic framework within which uh, specific choices uh, are made. And the Cree hunters in a way describe as having made a number of decisions that is uh, what are the numbers of decisions that is uh, to suit this animal, pass up another and uh, go on looking for a different one or maybe rather than uh, uh, engaging a suit, they can lay a trap for a tart and so on. This would in a sense imply that in reality this scope of uh, his autonomy in decision making is extremely restricted and, and, and rather options are exercised by individuals and groups. Now, it is pretty evident and clear that uh, no matter how an information or a knowledge is being passed from one member of one generation to other, uh, in the real setting, in reality, uh, an individual uh, to some extent has uh, a number of choices in taking a decision. Now, in this very context, uh, it is important to look at that uh, how a member in a sense is uh, simply trying to make uh, a decision. Now, how does a decision takes place then? The decision rules uh, in a way are more, more or less self-consciously from his seniors. That is how the elders are in a way influencing them in taking or making decisions and whose prevalence uh, in the society is due not to, not to the perceived efficacy, but rather to the fact that they serve his predecessor well. That is in allowing them to sort of bring in the food to support uh, the other members of the community. Therefore, this sort of uh, cultural heritage if not traditions are being uh, practices. So, in some way a members is to some extent restricted and compelled to uh, sort of con conform uh, with, with the other members of the uh, <coughs> society or culture group because they tend to reproduce the same strategic steps in their own uh, of within the capacity of being an economic man if not uh, engaging in these hunting activities. Now, uh, to make or to elaborate or to simplify what we have discussed, uh, if a particular strategy of hunting is inscribed within a particular cultural tradition and in that tradition, uh, if that tradition in a sense evolves through a process of natural selection 
then all the hunters in a way uh, can do is to carry on the same way rather than finding a different way out even if there is a changes in the environment or technology which might have uh, in the process effect uh, in wiping out its earlier advantages. Now, therefore, uh, by saying so, that does not mean that the behavior of the forager is completely prescribed uh, in making a choices, but still the individual still have uh, you know a different way of making de decisions and which in a way can be seen as uh, the strategic ideas uh, or within the strategic framework uh, that is how the kind of uh, training or practices which is being learned uh, within the as a member of that particular society in which he is uh, more or less being restricted or compelled to adopt that particular strategy. Now, uh, we can actually look at uh, some of the debate why this uh, being an economic man or economic uh, is to be contextualized in the discipline of anthropology that is uh, by looking at the differences between the formalism and substantivism. Now, the German uh, sociologist Max Weber in a sense uh, way back in 1947 uh, distinguishes uh, between the formal and the substantive aspects of this human rationality. Now, since we talk about rationality or rational choices, Weber tends to classify a different types of rationality. Now, rationality in a way is when an individual is guided by different situations. In the context of uh, if the norms and values of a society uh, can also in a way influences the uh, behavior or the rational choices of an individual or in other context if an individual set a particular goal depending on the kind of goal one will try to you know uh, find a way or a means to achieve that goal. So, in a way that practices is also a rational choices or in general a rationality. Now, the first in a way consists of the element of quantitative calculation or accounting which involve purely an economic decision making. When we talk about quantitative, we are in a way uh, using the sort of the mathematics of you know uh, what you are going to achieve and gain from what you do. Your action in a way is being guided by uh, the goal which you are trying, you are pursuing. So, in a way you can say it is a goal oriented action or goal oriented behavior. And uh, the second type is more of uh, subservience to uh, economic acti activity that is the ultimate uh, of uh, standards of value of uh, qualitative. When we talk about qualitative, it is more of the emotions which is, which is more to do with the uh, uh, customs, traditions and values of uh, or we can say the ethics of the society. Now, how far this kind of choices or the behavior uh, in a way is uh, governed by this rationality, because sometimes this self interested uh, incentive also uh, is uh, in opposition to the kind of cultural norms and ideas. You tend to pursue things uh, not just for your individual or individual interest or gain but for the larger uh, cultural thing. But once you pursue your action uh, because of your individual interests and choices, that will be uh, in a sense uh, <coughs> in contradiction to the societal values and norms. Now, this ideal 
typical Fraser in a sense uh, the models are free from this cultural constraint. When we talk about cultural constraint, we are talking about the cultural norms and ideas and in so far as uh, these real human beings are biased by their commitment to these cultural norms, uh, we as a member of, of that society will conform to the rules and behavior of that particular cultural group. Now, in this situation, if you try to look at the Cree hunters, for example, uh, have perceived uh, a different kind of wisdom in his uh, by in, in that cultural pattern where one is. Now, if one wants to actually uh, be liable to this prevent from this recognizing the kind of uh, or the course of action which is judged normally in terms of the objective rec reckoning of cause and benefits that is how an individual is guided by uh, a goal oriented action. Now, if you stretch further the kind of rationality and choices by citing an example of these Cree hunters for instance uh, an old hunters uh, generally are more strongly committed to the traditional ideals of spreading their effort across a range of species. They do not really limit themselves or their idea is not narrowed down to only a single species and they sort of continue to you know practice more of a holistic approach uh, in even in their hunting practices. So, what this in a way uh, so is which will be much more profitable uh, in the long run and which will in a way uh, give a chances of uh, regenerating if not uh, bringing a balance in the ecosystem. But when the younger lot uh, engage in or being fixed to a limited species, that particular species uh, over a period of time might chances are might that there it will it will become extinct. So, in the long run if you look at the, uh, <coughs> the whole uh, ecosystem or from more of a holistic approach, uh, it is uh, uh, the chances of causing more of bringing a negative implication is much more higher. Now, in contrast to the older generations, this young, the youngsters are much more committed to you know uh, traditional cultural values only in the eyes of the seniors and, and therefore, the kind of conformity and the values and attachment they share with the uh, uh, society is weak. And is simply because they are relying more on the specialization or bringing out a different uh, kind of strategy or technologies. Now, therefore, in this situation, it seems uh, pretty evident that uh, the strategy in a way is uh, an outcome of the pretty much calculative and uh, self-interested decisions on the part of these youngsters not to necessarily conform with the tradition and then imitate the practices which are being practiced by the uh, older generations. Now, given this context uh, of the kind of dilemma, the differences between the foraging communities like the Cree hunter that is the differences in choices, choice making and in differences in the use of strategy, the evolutions of technologies. We can perhaps uh, ask the questions by saying that are these Cree hunters in a way rightfully making choices or is these choices real or mere, merely metaphorical. Now, when we talk about metaphorical, it can be more to do with you know uh, sort of just uh, cultural practices or maybe 
uh, which is normally said and not done. Now, if assuming that if this is real, then this idea which is passed on as uh, sort of any an inherited schema, whether genetic or maybe whether it is cultural, and obviously this appeals to you know uh, a natural selections, which might uh, over time tends to be irrelevant. Now, as we had uh, been cited in the example, the youngsters are normally uh, pretending to follow or imitate their forefathers, but in reality they do not. So, this wisdom or knowledge which is being passed on over a period of time in the context of choices or natural selections becomes redundant if not irrelevant. Now, from the flip side, uh, if you look at the behavior of this hunter in a sense also follows a strategy which actually has evolved through the process of this natural selection. However, working on a more culturally rather than which is genetically transmitted characteristic. Then in this very context, the hunter in a way uh, is no more exercising the choices uh, in the matter where to go out and what kind of species one wants to pursue. And this in a way is to be seen as a behavior which is uh, you know uh, presumed to be under genetic control. Now, we can pose a question by saying that can the, the hunters be really geni under genetic control or do, do they have to be you know uh, conforming to the kind of traditions or cultural heritage of that group in order to make that kind of selections. Now, for example, Ansmeyer has uh, cited here where I quote the birds in a way has you know evolved some kind of uh, genetic uh, constitutions and then so is the animals. Therefore, they are genetically conditioned and uh, the kind of conditioning which is being given to them, uh, they, they, they will na naturally stay in that particular pattern. Now, which in a sense are shaped up through many thousands of generations in this natural selection, which in a way induces in this particular way to a specific conjunction of uh, sort of the environmental condition or what once uh, engage in this reduction in daylight hours may in a way uh, be part of what once is being trained to. So, therefore, this sort of genetic conditioning or genetic constitution is uh, what the non-humans are usually being uh, made up or shaped up. Now, we will try to look at uh, some of the um, reason and nature which is seen to be you know agents of uh, selection. What are, what are perhaps the kind of reason and the nature as to why or the factors which are responsible for this selection. Generally, what people think and do or assumes that uh, <coughs> whatever we do is a deliberate aim and uh, to obtain the greatest benefit from their actions. Now, uh, human by nature is uh, a rational being in the sense we make choices uh, in a way could benefit us rather than uh, which would be destructive and then uh, which eventually will uh, be a negative uh, in our efforts. So, we humans in a way are rational beings in that sense. Now, this relative uh, relative benefit which is being uh, sort of achieved from the alternative choices of action, however, can only be uh, measured in terms of p 
people's own subjective beliefs and preferences. Now, how do we make or uh, measure these subjective beliefs and preferences? Because uh, even uh, given the situations of the hunters in the forest. Now, because the younger lot has much more choices and uh, no matter how much they are being trained and guided by their elders and seniors, uh, at the times of, uh, times of selection, they go on with their individual's uh, subjective belief and preferences. Therefore, human, uh, the nature of human intentionality and rational choice uh, can be argued by saying that uh, it ultimately reveals only the proximate causes of behavior, while the ultimate causes lies in those selective forces. And what is these selective forces? Uh, is it based on reason or nature? Or also, we can ask a question that does human evolutionary ecology uh, did offer uh, any uh, account in this? Now, as uh, Simons has, you know, put it in the evolutionary ecology, uh, uh, what he says is the adaptiveness of behavior, whereas uh, which is a pro a properly a Darwinian account, because the, according to the Darwinian theory, Charles Darwin, in a way, says that uh, it is not the stronger of the species which will survive, but it is the one who is best adapting or adaptive will survive. So, in that context, uh, to you know confront if not adapt or to survive in an environment, one does not necessarily necessarily mean to be strong and then have that kind of power. Rather, one needs to have that adaptiveness uh, behavior and uh, which is primarily you know talked about by Darwin or Darwinism. Now, in this our idea is to look at what are the most basic goals that human is seeking, because human uh, constantly is engaged or influenced by different factors and in this we are constantly engaging in trying to seek a particular goal to achieve something. And uh, we are in a way shaping and molding our or acting out or our actions or behavior is being guided by these uh, preferences and these ideas. Now, and uh, that obviously also motivate uh, the behavior of an individual and if you see in the context of the natural selections. Uh, under this kind of environmental conditions, uh, which are experienced by the ancestral or the, uh, <coughs> the forebears population in the course of the evolution of our species. Now, therefore, one needs to attempt in looking at this kind of uh, action or orientation, how one's make a selection to, a to achieve uh, a particular uh, goal or what benefits them ultimately. So, because that actually uh, motivates one's behavior in terms of uh, making choices. Further, Simon are also argues that both the species specific and inflexible such that uh, the kind of uh, contemporary pursuit uh, is usually uh, be based on the environment evolutionary adaptiveness and which will eventually uh, perhaps lead to behavior whose consequences are seen to be profoundly maladaptive. Now, when we talk about maladaptive, we are also talking about not just the human, but uh, the kind of uh, balances which is being uh, <coughs> seen or to be contextualized in the human and non-behavior or with the environment. Now, when it becomes maladaptive, 
obviously it is not just the non-human which is going to be affected but in the long run it is also the human which will uh, you know bear the consequences now for example uh, uh, in a very you know simple term if you look at the examples of uh, a test for sweet things for example may have served the hunter and gather the ancestors uh, in a much more positive note, but in establishing a preference of a fruit when it is at its most nutritious. But in a more you know affluent society, in a much more say civilized or modern society, uh, the particular sweet things might not be preferable because. Uh, people are much more health conscious and then they might say that uh, it will be prone to uh, being obese or it is against the uh, this problems of obesity. So, the examples of uh, even the choices of food uh, which is prevalent in native societies and in a much more modern setting is also different and this is how uh, uh, sort of uh, an evolutionary uh, processes is taking place. Now, there is a different uh, uh, sort of concept which is being uh, uh, introduced and uh, which is called evolutionary psychology and which happens to grow up uh, in an effort to sort of uh, look at the, the capacities and dispositions which are conventionally gathered under the rubric of human nature and to explain how and why they evolve. Now, in evolutionary ecology, it tends to six uh, and tends to show how behavior is uh, sensitively responsive to variation in the environment, but that happens to lack uh, a coherent account of human nature. Rather, evolutionary psychology seeks to construct uh, such just such an account, but in doing so, they are much more being insensitive to the fine tuning of human behavior to environmental conditions. Now, we'll uh, quickly look at what is enculturation and enskillment. Now. Uh, Usually, as we said, knowledge is being transmitted, and this transmission of this uh, in knowledge must be distinguished from the experience of its applications in the particular settings of use. That is the practicability, or the practicality of how it is being used. The contrast to uh, between the two forms of learning, that is social and individual, which is talked about by Richardson and Boyd. In social learning, these uh, the novice absorbs the underlying rules and principles of hunting from directly knowledgeable members of community. In individual learning, in contradiction to that, he puts them to use in the course of his activities in the environment. That is, uh, the individual is much more equipped and in a, in a much more advantaged position. Uh, which sort of uh, knowledge is being used to enhance in his adaptiveness behavior in that particular environment. Now, most often time this sort of cultural transmission is uh, usually uh, seen to be simple process of copying and in which a whole inventory of rules and representation is sort of being passed on handed down to the receptive mind of the novice. That is, uh, things are being uh, accepted and conformed and practices without questioning or rather not trying to be sort of inno innovative. Now, uh, unless uh, this idea of decoding these signals is sort of uh, received from the social environment and to extract this information uh, which is contained in that particular 
environment or that setting. Human beings again are not born with uh, a ready-made architecture. Unlike uh, you know the non-humans, they are specialized ac acquisition of this mechanism and which are to deal with the external uh, setting, not just confined with the family. Now, this emerges as a process of uh, ontogenic development. Now, if such is the case and if uh, such is how the technology is being acquired. Now, through the use of different kind of semantic like the language acquisition device, which in a way is uh, sort of to have uh, undergo certain kind of uh, a formation in the individual through that process of uh, socialization of, of that particular skills which is being learned uh, through their elders or the uh, you know the ancestors. And at the same time if you look at uh, both the aspects in this developmental processes, it is uh, sometimes uh, difficult to differentiate and uh, to look at how uh, the learning of these particular skills which is being acquired can be uh, uh, you know uh, distinguished from the formation of this innate device. Uh, which is uh, pretty much you know uh, talk about by Ingold in terms of his uh, how the skillful learning of an individual uh, is engaged into. Now, this particular learning technical skills in a way depends on what might be called this technology acquisition support system. Now, if you looked at uh, as we were talking about how the novice tends to you know uh, are being receptive, are being conformist and then they learn what is being handed down. How does this the novice hunter in a way tries to uh, replicate if not bring out this knowledge into practice. This practical skills in a way is uh, sometime uh, seem to be you know fundamentally uh, quite resistant to the kind of uh, sort of codifications, how it is being encoded in terms of any formal systems of rules and representations and also the novice involvement uh, with other members of the society uh, and also with the non-human environment. And uh, finally, the no novice hunters learns by accompanying uh, more experienced hands in the woods. That is, it is more of uh, you know adapting and then trying to use that particular knowledge uh, in the environment. Therefore, we can in a way uh, say that this acute uh, uh, knowledge of know-how is usually being learned through uh, observation and imitation. However, in the sense are generally employed by, uh, uh, by, by this uh, enculturation theories. Now, what is this observation and imitation? How is this being uh, sort of adopted by the uh, sort of the novice? Now, observation is nothing but to you know uh, observe actively to attend to the movement to others. That is not just what is the word which is being shared, but even the nonverbal kind of uh, uh, communications or ideas which is being passed on. So, it is more of practical in nature and uh, imitation is to sort of uh, the attention to the movement of one's uh, practical orientation towards the environment. So, in a sense this sort of uh, one's adjustment or uh, resonance in relation to this uh, the hunters and his surroundings is the hallmark of a skill practices. This is what in goal talk about the uh, <coughs> skill and skill man. Therefore, uh, these ideas uh, which is 
seem to be in fine tuning perception and action is going for a better understood and also this as a process of this enskillment this then as one uh, enculturation. Now, for what is involved is not a uh, uh, transmission of uh, representation as the en enculturation model implies, but this is rather to be understood on the education of attention that is through uh, observation and imitation. Now, for instance, the instru instruction which is being provided to the novice hunter, what he receives is to watch out for this that is to attend to that and so on that is to watch out and to attend and also to practice that particular ideas into action and uh, to sort of uh, demonstrate that meaning in the context of his engagement with the environment. Hence, uh, this sort of enskillment uh, makes no sense to speak of culture as an independent body of context free knowledge that is available for transmission prior to the situation of its application. Therefore, uh, a technique such as interstice phrasing uh, is not just uh, passed on as a part of any systematic body of culture presentation, rather it is inculcated in its successive generation through a process of development in the course of novice practical uh, involvement with the constituents of their environment. That is, uh, it is important for ones to practice that in a particular environment, otherwise that particular knowledge will become uh, irrelevant or redundant. Uh, therefore, under the guidance of those mentors, they are able to replicate and then put those skills into practice. Now, if we go back to that economic man, uh, rather an economic man is credited with the capacity to work out his strategies for himself. No doubt that idea or knowledge may be passed on to him, but that compared to the novice man, this economic man is much more dynamic in character and then they come up with certain kind of innovative ideas and strategies for himself that work out for him by through natural selection and they happens to you know uh, appear and stand in a much more uh, overriding in a better position than others. Now, uh, to sort of conclude the scientists in the case of these uh, evolutionary ecologies tends to engage in the constructing an abstract model on the base which can sort of calculate what it would be best for a hunter and gatherer to do. And this sort of uh, prediction is then tested against uh, what the hunter gatherer actually does. So, it is really you know like uh, different from what the uh, idea of uh, a native society's uh, sort of knowledge and the scientist's knowledge is different again. The hunter gatherers are in a way uh, sort of a group of members uh, who are more or less relying on carrying this uh, business of life and uh, in a much more you know in a content manner and uh, which which do not have much much of a very ambitious in terms of accumulation of uh, you know resources. So, they move on within this uh, sort of a continual process of involvement in both this uh, human and non-human components of their environment. So, I stop in this and uh, over here in this lecture, we tend to look at the kind of uh, boundaries uh, which are normally looked at and discussed and uh, for further understanding and readings you can refer these uh, uh, readings by Foley and uh, team in gold, uh, so that you can have much more uh, extensive knowledge. Thank you.